ahead and turn your Bibles to Colossians 1. You know, today is the day, uh, traditionally in the church, Palm Sunday, where Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that was a time when he seemed like he was preeminent, but that was very short-lived, as we know. And by the end of the week, the same crowd that was saying, hail him, hail him, hallelujah, praise, you know, Hosanna in the name of David and all that stuff, was saying, crucify him, crucify him. Well, today, uh, as I mentioned last time, as we study this epistle of Colossians, we're going to discover how the church at Colossae was being told that it needed more than Jesus to feel secure and confident about its spiritual standing before God. And feeling insecure and inadequate made the church vulnerable to the suggestion that they needed to syncretize some of their beliefs and practices with those of the surrounding culture in order to gain security and develop competency. I also mentioned to you that all religious air contains one or all of the following elements. An inadequate view of God, an inappropriate reliance upon self, or an insufficient stance upon grace. We find Colossae is falling prey to all of those. And what we actually see in Colossae are the seeds of early Gnosticism, or what we're going to call pre-Gnosticism. It was just Gnostic beliefs and doctrines were just beginning to develop and sprout there in places like Colossae. Now, actual Gnosticism as a religious philosophy, it was this esoteric uh, religious movement. Esoteric means it's intended for only a few with special knowledge, you know, an elite group. Uh, It flourished during the second and third centuries. And the letter to the church at Colossae was written in the first century, so true Gnosticism was not yet in existence, but the seeds of it were. So again, Paul's not dealing with Gnostics, he's dealing with pre-Gnostics. And most of these sects form of uh, Christianity, but their beliefs were far afield from accepted Christian doctrine. The most cardinal doctrine of these sects is what we call dualism. Dualism is the philosophy that the created universe is evenly divided between two cosmic forces. One is good and one is evil. Now, where was this idea of a cosmic force, good and evil, most recently repackaged in our own culture? In Star Wars, with the light and dark sides of the force. Well, in the pre-Gnostic and Gnostic system of dualism... What they believed is that the immaterial spirit was good and any physical matter was evil. Obviously, in holding such a view, they could not imagine how a pure spirit would ever become permanently united with evil physical matter, which was the teaching of Christianity about Jesus Christ. This mentality of a separation of spirit and body emerges in many forms and is evolved. We have our own view of Gnosticism right now going on in our culture. Because what is one of the hottest topics right now? The idea that the body of a person and the spirit of a person may be incompatible. In other words, in today's culture, there's this idea prevalent in our culture right now, that my outward form, my outward body, may not properly reflect my true self, my inner spirit. There is even the current idea that, you know, people needing to undergo some kind of enlightenment in order to grasp this reality. In truth, what we see going on in our culture right now is just another form of of Gnosticism. The ethical teachings of the Gnostics range from asceticism. And asceticism is the belief that the body has to be harmed. You have to do harm to the body, and that is somehow to the spirit's benefit when you harm and restrict the body and its urges. And then 
it went from there, asceticism, all the way over to the exact polar opposite to libertinism. And that was the view that the body can do whatever it wants because it has no effect upon the spirit. Now, with regard to asceticism, the doctrine that the body and the material world are evil, it led some of these sects to renounce all worldly pleasure. They practiced self-denial in all of its forms. This was not a fun group to be proud of or be part of. They renounced all worldly pleasures and, of course, as you know, becoming the Baptist of the present day. Now, <laughs> just kidding. Others held that the spirits were completely alien to this world. So it did not matter what you did with your physical body, for the spirit and the body were unmixed. Therefore, the body could be indulged. In their view, as the body was not the true self, the body's needs and desires did not affect the true self, so why not just let the body do whatever it wants, thereby becoming the Catholics of the present day? No, I just... <laughs> Again, just kidding. Everybody relax. So one system of thought said the spirit cannot do what it wants unless the body is subjected to some kind of hardship and denial. And the other system of thought said the body could do whatever it wants because the spirit is completely unaffected by whatever the body does. Guess which one was more popular? Uh, Now, to its devotees... These sects promised a secret knowledge of, a, of the spiritual realm and of the origin of the universe. To explain how a material universe even developed, they had a very complicated mythology. Basically, their explanation as to the origins of the universe was the following. There was a series of lesser divinities that flowed or emanated from the original, most unknowable uh, supreme being. Think of it as a copy of a copy of a copy. If you have an original, and then you made a copy of the original, and then you made a copy of that copy, and then a copy of that copy, and a copy of that copy, and so on and so forth, you would find the image deteriorating over time. So this is their explanation how there was this most unknowable supreme being and then there were these lesser divinities that flowed from or emanated from that being. Until finally, one of these lesser divine beings named Sophia, uh, which means wisdom, developed a desire to know the original most unknowable supreme being. And this desire was considered to be illegitimate. No one should seek to know the unknowable. And out of this illegitimate desire, another God formed. And that God was an evil God. And that God was still powerful enough to create a material universe, but too stupid to know why they shouldn't. And the sex identified this evil God with who? The God of the Old Testament. They said the God of the Old Testament was this evil God. And they believed that the Old Testament was an account of this evil God's attempt to keep humanity immersed in ignorance and to punish them for any attempts they made to acquire knowledge. And so it was in that light that they understood the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Why did Adam and Eve get expelled? Because they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. And that God did not want them to have knowledge. So he punished them. It was in this light they understood the Tower of of Babel, that all the people of the world were uniting. And they were gathering knowledge. And this evil God confused their languages and spread them about the earth. Now, in this kind of theology of these lesser divinities uh, coming or flowing from the most unknowable supreme being, Jesus is not unique. He's just one of the many emanations from that unknowable most supreme being. He was more like 
a rung of a ladder that you had to climb for spiritual enlightenment. He was an important rung, but he was not preeminent. He was not the main rung in the ladder for sure. And so when it came to Jesus, they either taught that Jesus was not really human at all, he only appeared to be human because they couldn't conceive of a pure spirit inhabiting an evil material body, or they believed that the pure Christ spirit temporarily inhabited the evil material body of a man named Jesus, but that spirit vacated that evil body prior to the crucifixion and ascended back to the divine realm. So either way you slice it, the Gnostics rejected both the necessity of the physical uh, cality of Jesus and the need of his physical death and the promise of a physical resurrection of his body. So we see these pre-Gnostic sects believed in a supreme being, they believed in a need for salvation and they believed in spirit beings, but they also believed that the brand of Christianity preached by Paul and others was crude and primitive interpretation of spiritual reality. So to counteract and neutralize this teaching, Paul mentions seven unique characteristics of Christ which fittingly qualify him to have the preeminence. Paul says, Jesus is... The image of God. He's the image of the most supreme being. Paul says he is the firstborn over creation. He was preeminent over all created things. He's not part of created order. order. He's over created order. Because third, he's the creator of the universe. He's head of the church. He's firstborn from the dead. He has the fullness of God and he's the reconciler of all things making this passage that we're going to explore today one of the most theologically rich passages concerning the deity of Christ that you can find in the Bible. So let's begin with he is the image of the invisible God. What does it mean that Jesus is the image of the invisible God? It's almost like a non sequitur. How could you be the image of something invisible? Charles Wesley captured the essence of the first part of this verse in his wonderful Christian hymn, or Christmas hymn, rather, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Remember, he wrote, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Chuck Swindoll likes to say that we have chili con carne, which means chili with meat. And he says, Jesus was God con carne. He was God with meat. Many uh, men for centuries could only speculate as to what God was really like, and Jesus made the invisible God visible. How did he do so? Hebrews 1, verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The word translated here as exact representation is where we get our English word character. Jesus is the exact character of his father's being. And what he means by that is this. The word character was used to describe the wax sealing process of the first century. So there was a stamp that had a symbol on it, and you made an impression in wax so that after you made that impression, the wax now bore the exact characteristics of the stamp. Well, Jesus bears the exact characteristics of his father. People often wonder, what is God the Father like? And the author of Hebrews tells us he is like Jesus because Jesus bears his exact representation. That's why Jesus was incredulous when Philip, his disciple, asked him, show us the Father. In John 14, 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Here in Colossians, Paul makes the same kind of statement that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the perfect resemblance and representation of God. That's why John wrote 
in his gospel, in John 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. The Son is at the Father's side. Literally, it says, at his bosom, thus revealing the intimacy of the Father and the Son. Furthermore, the Son has made the Father known. Now, when I first went off to Bible college, and I began taking Greek and different things that you take when you go off to Bible college, uh, they kept talking about exegesis, exegesis. And I'm thinking, well, this is a Christian college. We shouldn't be exing out Jesus. What are they talking about? And, And so... Exegesis is a word that means you take from the text and explain it, making it understandable to someone else. What I'm doing right now is I am exegeting the text of Colossians. John says that Jesus is the exeget of the Father. He explains the Father, and as a result of his work, The nature of the invisible father is revealed through the son. Now, to the religious sects of Colossae, the very idea of God taking on flesh was preposterous because in their view, the body was a prison for the spirit. That a spirit God who was above time, space, and dimension would agree to imprison himself in flesh and appear in time limiting himself to the dimensions of this world was laughable to the Greek mind because one of the chief characteristics of God in the Greek mind, at least the supreme being, was that he had complete and total apathy toward humankind. Men may reach up for God, but God would never stoop down for men. Plato said never man and God can meet. However, Paul says they did meet and they met in the man Jesus. Then he says he's the firstborn over all creation. The first thing you have to get out of your head when you see this term firstborn is that it means born first. It's confusing because most of the time, whoever was born first also received the title of firstborn. But that is what firstborn really refers to. It refers to a title, not to when somebody was born. So some cults, like the ones that come into your neighborhoods with boys on bicycles claiming to be elders, or the ones that uh, walk door to door carrying their briefcases and passing out their magazines, they would insist that firstborn means created first. Jesus is the first created thing. However, the Greeks had a word for created first, and they did not use the term Firstborn to refer to first created. They had another word for that. Firstborn is a messianic title. Here in Psalm 89, 27, Father says, I will appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. So the sense of the firstborn as preeminent is a concept that is strongly supported in the Old Testament. Not long ago, we were studying the life of Jacob, and we observed that Jacob was twin to his brother Esau. Esau was actually born first, but Jacob, the other twin, the second born twin, actually received the title and the blessings of the firstborn. Later, with Joseph's sons, Jacob's grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they were brought before him for a blessing. And Jacob gave the firstborn blessing to Ephraim, the secondborn twin, instead of giving it to Manasseh, the firstborn twin. So in calling Jesus the firstborn over creation, Paul is saying Jesus has preeminence over creation, not that he was the very first thing created. And the very next verse explains why he is entitled to this title of firstborn. Verse 16, for by him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible things and invisible things, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
So these verses clearly reveal that Jesus could not be a part of God's creation because all things were created by him, by Jesus. If he, if he is himself created, then he did not create all things. And since he created all things, he must be uncreated. Notice the words by him and for him. He was the cause of every created thing, visible and, in, and invisible. And the reason for everything that was created. Christ is not only the one through whom all things came to be, but also the one by whom they continue to exist. He sustains his creation. The Son's creation, him being creator, includes all things in heaven and earth. These indicate the entire universe. He created the entire universe Everything that is visible, material, everything that is invisible, immaterial. This would also include angelic beings who are invisible. These religious sects were teaching, though, that the universe consisted of a hierarchy of angels and messengers and that you advance spiritually by starting at the bottom and working your way up through this whole hierarchy of angels and messengers until finally you got to God. We see a similar belief today, I think, in working your way through a series to get to the next plane of spirituality uh, in uh, Eastern mysticism, repackaged as reincarnation. In reincarnation, you work your way up through countless lives and incarnations until you're finally enlightened to the point of perfection. This belief of working your own way <laughs> to spiritual enlightenment through successive categories of angels or messengers degraded Christ by making him less unique and more ordinary. In their view, Jesus was not above, preeminent over all these other things. He's simply another part of the process. So Paul counters that both material and immaterial creation, including angelic beings, were not only created by him, they were also created for him. They are subject to him. In other words, all of creation operates for his honor and his glory. He is the reason why all things have been made. The greatest purpose of all created beings is to honor and glorify Jesus, for he made them. They all exist because of him, and they continue to exist because of him. Warren Wiersbe points out that the ancient Greek philosophers taught that everything needed a primary cause, which is the plan, Everything needed an instrumental cause, the power to implement the plan, and everything needed a final cause, uh, cause, the purpose of the plan fulfilled. So Paul has written that when it comes to Jesus and the universe, Jesus is the primary cause. He planned the universe. Jesus is the instrumental cause. His power produced the universe, and Jesus is the final cause. Everything in the universe was created for his purposes. In the following verse, Paul turns his focus from creation in general to more specifically on the new creation. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Christ is not only preeminent over the material and immaterial elements of the universe, he is preeminent spiritually over the new creation. For he is the head of the body, the church. Paul relates that just as a head and a, a torso relate to one another in a physical body, so does Jesus and his church in a spiritual way. This is one of the most important statements in the New Testament about the church. God has actually given us an example of our, from our own bodies so that we may understand how the church is to function. How many people here today have a body? Looks like 60% as far as I can tell. How many people today, here today have a head? Again, the numbers are fairly high from what I can tell. Uh, to understand the church and how it should function... We only need to think about our bodies and our heads and how they cooperate and coordinate with one another. When we become Christians, we are said to be made a part of the body of Christ. Now, what is the connection between our head and our body? The head supplies the direction for the body and maintains proper working order of the body by coordinating the activities 
of the body. It's the command center for the body. What happens if for some reason the head and the body get out of sorts? Well, complete chaos occurs. You know, every once in a while, I experience something called vertigo. It's a very odd sensation. You, you cannot get your body to do what you want it to do. Uh, the room is spinning. My head feels heavy. My limbs uh, do not coordinate. They're getting mixed signals. So I stumble and fall. I cannot function properly unless my head and my body are communicating with one another and my body is following my head's direction. So just as Jesus is preeminent over creation, he is preeminent over the church. So if people ask you, who is the head of Dove Creek Bible Church, the answer is not Jeff. The answer is not the elders of this church. The answer is Jesus. When Paul says that Christ is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, he means that Jesus was the first one, the first person to rise from the dead in an immortal body. His death instituted the new covenant and began the church and the age of grace empowered living as opposed to the law precept and the principle of living uh, by the old covenant. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have how much of his fullness, how much of his fullness dwells in Christ? All. All of his fullness dwells in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The next description of the exalted Christ is that all of God's fullness dwells in him. The full and complete deity is said to dwell, abide lastingly or permanently in Christ. Some are concerned that these verses might be taken to teach universalism because it says, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. And some say, well, if he reconciles all things to himself, that means that someday everybody's going to be saved. And maybe even Satan and his angels are going to somehow be saved from damnation and no one will ever be uh, punished forever. However, Paul has switched subjects from creation in general to simply dealing with the new creation. There's only a certain group that is part of the new creation, and that's you and I and people who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. He is the reconciler of all new creation to himself. And some of these redeemed folks are here with us on this earth right now, and some of these redeemed folks are in heaven. He made peace through through the blood of his cross and caused former enemies to become, by grace through faith, God's children. We'll talk more about that uh, after Easter. In summary, this is actually a hymn. These verses are a hymn. There's two stanzas to the hymn and this ode to Jesus. The first stanza is Christ is the firstborn of all creation, meaning he created all things in general and he's preeminent or the head over all of things created. That is the point of verses 15 through 17. The second stanza, you can tell each stanza because it says firstborn. That indicates a new stanza. The second stanza begins much in the same style. Christ is also firstborn from the dead, rising from the grave, bringing the resurrected life of the new creation to all those he reconciled to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And so he is the head over all the new creation. That's the point of verses 18 through 20. And like a head directs and controls the body, he directs and controls his body, the church. All right, let's talk about application. First application is this. Jesus is unique in his preeminence and in his person. So the false teaching that was going around Colossae was that spirit and matter could never coexist. Therefore, Jesus could not have been a material, physical being And if he was a material, physical being, that proved he could not be God, for it was nonsensical to them uh, to refer to someone as God in the flesh. To this, Paul responds, this man Jesus is also the one and the same God who created everything that exists, material and immaterial. He created all of it. All of it exists for him, uh, and he sustains all of it. 
Christ is no mere creature. He is the very image of the living God. He possesses the fullness of God. If one were to take from Christ his divine preeminence over all creation, we would not have a Christian gospel. For if Jesus is not God, there is no bridge that can span the chasm between God and man. Neither the highest of angels nor the best of men can bridge that gap. Only one person can do that. And that is the one who is both God and man. Because for a bridge to be secure, it has to be secured on both sides. So that is how Jesus is the perfect bridge, the perfect mediator. The fact that we believe Jesus is the only bridge is why Christianity is often offensive to people of other faiths. They ask, why can't you recognize that all religions have leaders who can lead us to salvation? Why do you have to claim that Jesus is the only one who could provide the way of salvation? What does it matter to say that Jesus is God? It matters because only through Jesus can you be saved or even know what God is like. And what we discover is God is exactly like Jesus because Jesus is exactly like God. As someone has said, read this carefully, posted it for you, though Jesus was never ever less than God, he was willing to behave as though he was never, ever more than man. To give life to men who, though they are never, ever more than men, behave as if they are never, ever less than God. They never, ever become more than men until they understand that Jesus was never, ever less than than God. So Jesus came not only to show men the way to God in heaven, but to show the God in heaven to men. Jesus is the only way God can be seen. Life application number two, Jesus is unique in his authority and position over the new creation, the church. The false teachers in Colossae were saying that Jesus may, is just one of many rungs in a ladder that lead to spiritual enlightenment. He's no more important than that. He's just one in a series. And Paul views it very, very differently. He, is, he says he's, he is the one and the only one. There is no spiritual growth or enlightenment apart from him because Jesus is linked to all the redeemed like a head is linked to its body. He supplies the redeemed with resurrection life, and this is why Christians living in a world that is falling apart at the seams. Wars, earthquakes, brutal dictators, dreadful diseases, unspeakable poverty, terrible injustice. We can still look to the one who says, I hold everything together. And all of these things will be reconciled to him. Wherever there is chaos now, there's going to be calm. Wherever there is conflict now, there's going to be peace. Wherever there is injustice now, there's going to be justice. Why? So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. So now the question is, does he have the supremacy in my life, in everything? Why does Paul put it this way? He might have the supremacy. Can any of us honestly say that he does? That right now in my life, he has the supremacy in everything? We all know he should. But does he? Does he really have the supremacy in my plans and my decisions? You know, the honest answer for me is sometimes. Sometimes he does. 
Does he have the supremacy in my words and my actions? Again, my answer would have to be sometimes. Sometimes he does. In my daily schedule and how I spend my time and my energy, does he have the supremacy? Does he only have it sometimes? In my heart and in my mind, does he have the supremacy or does he only have it sometimes? There's no question about it. He should have the supremacy now and every day. But somehow, some way, I find a way to quietly say no and reassert my own preeminence. I guess the question really I wonder about is, What kind of a world of difference would it make if he actually did have the supremacy in all these things, in all of our lives? What I've discovered is that becoming a Christian is so easy. Being a Christian is so hard. Because I don't want to give him the supremacy in everything. But I'm learning, I hope, and I hope you are too. I'm learning the longer I walk with him to give supremacy to him in more things more of the time. And for now... I can rest in the knowledge that one day he will have it fully. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we consider now your word, you know, it's it's so easy to say those words. Oh, yes. Christ has a supremacy in my life. I have make no plans or thoughts without taking him into consideration. And all of my daily decisions, whatever I decide to do, it's always focused on him and him having the supremacy and the preeminence. But not true. Not true. Oh, that it were true. Praise God that one day it will be. In the meantime, we are all learning the importance of giving Christ the preeminence of more and more things in our life, more and more of the time. But we do that imperfectly. And that's why we needed a God and Savior in the first place. We needed Jesus, who was never, ever less than God, to come here to this earth and behave for a while as if he was never, ever more than man. so that we men and women who truth be told rarely think of ourselves as ever, ever less than God can become the men and women that he wants us to be. Lord, I pray that you will have preeminence in this church, in my walk and in my life, more and more 
each day, Lord, I pray that we'll learn how to say no to myself and my own preeminence. And bow the knee before the one who is above all others, the name that is above all other names. The Lord of lords and King of kings my Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for everything that you do in and for us and through us. We pray, Lord, as we come upon the Christmas, or Easter season, rather, Lord, pray that um, you would draw people to yourself, that we'd use Dove Creek, the people of Dove Creek, as a vehicle to draw people to yourself this season. We sense that maybe the time is getting short. I don't know how much time is left in this crazy world in which we live. But in whatever time we have left, either personally or collectively, Lord, may our light shine bright before others. I pray all this in the name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ's name. And all God's people said.